for Rare Metals Inc. Trades on the OTCQX, UURAF, and the TSXV under UCU. It's focused on rare and critical metal resources, extraction, benefaction, and separation technologies with the potential for production, growth, and scalability. Welcome back, CEO Pat Ryan. Pat, we are ready for your update today. Thanks for joining us. Sure, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'll go through fairly quick and uh, hopefully provide some current market detail that uh, that helps the audience. Um, and note, note on the title here, policy changes reshaping the global rare earth market. A lot, of, uh, a lot of news of late, and we're right in the middle of a lot of it. So uh, just a reminder for, for everyone, rare earth permanent magnets, that's where the rare earth story goes to most frequently. It's, um, uh, you know, use in... Uh, uh, electrification of vehicles, uh, national defense, robotics. Think of uh, Amazon warehouses with, uh, you know, logistical distribution, and whatnot. Sustainable uh, uh, energy, wind energy. There's two tons of permanent magnets that go into a Halliad X offshore wind turbine. And again, permanent magnets are the most efficient means of converting electrical energy into mechanical energy. Uh, complete, completely controlled by China. 95% refining controlled by China. 65% of the resource controlled by China. Very uh, precarious position as trade wars go on. Um, things like F-35 fighters, nuclear submarines, night vision systems, uh, missile guiding systems, communications, um, uh, weapons conveyance, all of it controlled by rare earth. Really a single point of failure without those rare earth elements. And some of the policy changes of late have um, made it very difficult to get these materials out of China, in particular for defense. You just will not get it at all. Some of the news that uh, you would have read clips about is uh, certainly that in April 25, there were seven of the 17 critical reads have been banned and they were very laser focused. They were precise on what they were trying to get done, meaning NDPR, which is a light rare earth, is not even on the banned export list at this point. But what is on the export list of bans are things like terbium dysprosium. They're heavy rare earth. They're 99.9% .9 controlled by China currently. You, of course, focused on processing those. Samarium using samarium cobalt magnets. China has banned that. You, of course, focused on producing samarium at its first um, strategic metals complex in Louisiana. June of 25, Wall Street Journal reported that not only was the technology stopping, uh, stopped from exporting from China, but passports were being confiscated. Uh, anyone that had any knowledge of, of uh, intel relative to rare earth processing, both upstream and downstream, it was a problem, and uh, you weren't going to get any of that intel coming out of China. August 11th, the trade truce is up. There's still 90 more days. The reason there's 90 more days of trade truce is because you're not going to settle on a solution for rare earths. It just won't happen. And defense is certainly choked off in that regard. So a lot of that is what you're hearing in the, uh, in the news. To remind everyone where we fit in the supply chain, we're right in the middle. Our rapid S technolo technology is right in the middle. It builds the bridge between the mining and the downstream, which is the metal making, the alloy uh, ma making, and the, uh, and the magnet making. So there are projects around the world that are rare earth uh, resources, but they need to be refined and, and brought into uh, the seeds of technology, as the Japanese call it, in order to really um, take, take advantage of those permanent magnet manufacturing. That's where UCOR's focus, right in the dead center. One, one quick analogy is think about Rockefeller back in the 1880s. Rockefeller realized that crude oil production and its boom and bust was not the place to put your money. Uh, and it wasn't on the end product at the end. It was actually in the oil refining. And if you controlled the oil refining, you actually then could control the flow of the industry, and it became America's first great uh, uh, mega monopoly because of the uh, control of the oil refining. And, and again, it was more predictable, it was more stable. You could get your margins there, and, and the re-industry is really likened to that. Just imagine if China had 95% control of oil production or oil refining right now. That, that would be a very different story, and that's what's happening with rare earth. Uh, UCOR, we've got a commercial demonstration, demonstration plant on the left, which... Uh, is in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. We continue to run many hours on the on the plant. Uh, we've run many different feedstocks from around the world that are getting ready for deployment in the Louisiana facility, which is the building on the right. And we've started, We had, on May 29th, we had our uh, groundbreaking. We had Department of Defense at our groundbreaking, along with um, people from um, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, was there because he's from central Louisiana. Uh, we had uh, Senators Cassidy and others, uh, high officials, a really good turnout. Uh, because we're looking to launch that plant in mid-26 with stage one. There are three stages of development, stage one, two, three, and um, stage one is underway because of the Department of Defense standing behind what we're doing. Uh, that Department of Defense looks like this. I think we announced this at our last update, but it's certainly well underway now. 
We've got the civil site work going on. We've got the work going on inside this building. It's a brownfield building. And it's a foreign trade zone, which means if we bring material in from Brazil, from Australia, from Vietnam to process and turn into magnets that go in the American economy or perhaps back to Japan, where a lot of magnet making is starting to develop, then it's tariff free. And that, that's something we didn't realize two years ago when we found this building. But we currently have $22.4 million support from the U.S. government to say, go ahead and let's build stage one. We love the technology. We love what you've done in Kingston. We like, like your comparative to legacy solvent extraction. Let's go ahead and execute rapid SX. Let's get to commercial deployment. Uh, and that is now well underway with mid-26 being the commissioning of stage one of our plant. Uh, so yeah, the rules of the game are changing as well. You know, the Western governments are, are stepping in with strategic investments. There was news of late about uh, an investment in MP materials. That is good for everyone in the Western world because floor pricing was set. $110 a kilogram for NDPR, which is about twice the spot price in China, which is often manipulated. And that support from the DOD shows that we're going to get behind companies with the right tech and the right direction. And UCOR is inside that tent now. We're looking for further support from the White House. We're in those negotiations right now, in particular with our heavyware earth uh, processing. We're looking for some floor pricing on heavyware earth as we work through our offtake arrangements. From a macro scale, uh, this is what you're looking at in the Western world. There's a gap between the permanent magnets that are needed by 2034 um, uh, compared to what's actually coming online. You think of that MP deal I just mentioned, that's only for 10,000 tons of uh, permanent magnets. Look at the requirement by 2035, 180,000. Or the global level is 600 to 650,000 tons of permanent magnets. And again, everything from robotics, semiconductors, um, renewable energy. When you make an investment in UCOR, you're investing in those technologies because we are at the centerpiece of those seeds of technology. And finally, from a macro level, uh, our, our technology is at the right place now. We've uh, we've worked over many years to get it in a good form. We've run over 6,000 hours in our plant. The DOD likes what they see. And uh, we're backed by the Department of Defense. That Department of Defense allows for reduced financial risk, strategic validation, accelerated development, and um, multi-year demand in uh, very growing industries, disprosium, turbine being key. That was it. All right, Pat. Well, thank you. We do have a bunch of questions for you. Let's see how many we can get in. Uh, let's start with Bernie asks, uh, U.S. House of Representative Mike Johnson's congressional district is adjacent to SMC in Alexandria. So will Speaker Johnson be visiting the SMC anytime soon? Uh, you know, possibly. Uh, we, we, have our, we had our groundbreaking, which is on May 29th, and we had... Uh, Again, various uh, people from Washington and from uh, the local state of Louisiana, from the local community come and attend. Uh, when we get to our final uh, opening of the building, ribbon cutting, uh, quite possibly. It's a, it's a big deal. The uh, Department of Defense arrived for that grand opening. They explained how this would become an ecosystem for rare earth processing, not just with our oxide production, but ongoing production of uh, potential alloy making and, and maybe some magnet making there as well. And with that event, Theo asks, will it, it will it be announced soon and will it be open to the public? Uh, yeah, once once we do have uh, that ribbon cutting for the uh, ceremony, yes, it will be open. The groundbreaking was open to the public and we anticipate the building and its launch will be open to the public as well. With certain caveats, we're not going to allow people to come in and take a real close look at some of our tech, which has been developed over several years. So we'll we'll keep our trade secret uh, trade secret. And great. Are there, uh, Tim asks, any updates on supply or offtake agreements? Uh, yeah, on the offtake side, what I can say is we're moving close on several fronts, and we've got a rounded wheel there. We've got a couple of defense contractors we're talking with. They have needs. Uh, defense uh, costs have gone up 5x when it comes to the rare earth side of things right now. We have a couple of EV companies that are involved in discussions. We have Permanent Magnet, as well as some global trading houses that uh, are looking at uh, South Korea and Japan very closely and what the needs are in those markets. So we've got a pretty good, well-rounded wheel of discussions going on on the offtake side. They're between 12 and $15 million per offtake agreement. On the feedstock side, similar. We have one or two or three, uh, three in particular, that are looking to feed Louisiana by mid-26, and we're working out definitive arrangements of that side as well. Rob asks, has UCOR been approached either by, by by a major financed or partnership agreement by a larger mining company or other interests? Uh, we have all sorts of large banks that are certainly circling right now. You know, apart from our 
uh, uh, money and backing with the DOD, which is an OTA, other transaction agreement. So further uh, grant money from the government is potentially forthcoming. And, and Washington is certainly looking at us with a, a real critical eye as to where we fit in this, this whole mix, particularly with their M MP investment. We become a natural to sort of take on the heavy rare earth and some of the samarium cobalt. But yeah, there are larger institutions looking at us. There are uh, banks in particular with big institutional investors that realize that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, this is a, it's like a Rockefeller story where you're taking over that refining of critical rare earth uh, elements here. And, and, uh, and that, that gap right in the middle, which is 95% controlled by China, uh, you, you take that back, you're taking the bottleneck away that uh, creates an industry now that starts to flow much more effectively. So you can imagine bigger companies are looking at us figuring out where we fit in the whole picture. But right now we've got customer relationships and feedstock relationships. So we're gonna keep moving forward to get uh, well into our revenue production before we look at any bigger players perhaps stepping in. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. We have lots of questions for you. We will send them to you. You can answer on your own time, but we appreciate you being here with this important update today, Pat. Hey, thanks very much. All right, everyone, that completes day one. We will see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern for day two of our virtual investor conference. Thank you all for joining us.